If you're looking for a thrifty way to boost the health of your soil in the garden this autumn, cover crops are the answer. Thanks to On The Ledge sponsors True Leaf Market, you can rehab your soil the same way that farmers do, by growing cover crops. It's inexpensive and it really works. True Leaf Market have been selling heirloom and organic garden seeds since 1974 and they offer a great selection of cover crop seeds, including their all-purpose garden cover crop mix. Their most popular cover crop seeds for home gardeners like you. To get a free PDF of True Leaf Market's Beginner's Guide to Growing Cover Crops, visit True Leaf Market and search Cover Crop Guide. Order your cover crops online now at trueleafmarket.com and use promo code OTL10 to save $10 on any order of $50 or more. That's trueleafmarket.com and enter OTL10 for $10 off your first order. Check out the show notes at janeperone.com for that link to True Leaf Market's free cover crop PDF and full terms and conditions. Hello and welcome to on the Ledge podcast. I'm Jane Perone, and this week it's all about the AGM. We're not holding an annual general meeting. I'm talking about planty AGMs. A way of finding out which plants are really worth growing. And I answer a question about VPD what it means and how it could affect your house plants. Do house plants and birds of prey mix? Well, I discovered the answer unexpectedly last night when a bird of prey flew into my conservatory plant room through an open door. Fortunately, it was a small bird of prey. I think it was a peregrine falcon. And I know you're going to be saying, Jane, pictures or it didn't happen. Well, unfortunately, I was so focused on the well-being of the bird and not going to lie, my plants, that my first concern was getting it out the door as quickly as possible, which I did manage to do. It managed to fly behind a set of glass shelves and wedge itself between the shelves and the door, the door that doesn't normally get opened. And I was faffing about getting a oven cloth to think about trying to capture it when my husband wisely said, why don't you just open the other door? Which I did and the bird gratefully flew away. But it was an unexpected drama, I have to say, and I really wish I had taken some pictures because it was an absolutely beautiful thing. And amazingly, it didn't do any harm to my plants that I'd seen, but it's not something I'd recommend reproducing if you can avoid it. Now, I think most of you have probably heard of the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society. It's a long-standing charity here in the UK, which supports all things horticultural. And Probably the RHS is most famous around the world for its shows like RHS Chelsea Flower Show, but it does loads of other work as well. And one of the things I've been involved with for the past few months is the RHS plant trials and the resulting AGMs. And that's what I'm going to be discussing in this week's show. We'll be finding out what an AGM is, how a plant gets awarded an AGM and what it means for you as somebody growing plants and buying plants for your collection. If you've ever seen the initials AGM written after a plant name or perhaps seen a small trophy symbol next to a plant in a catalogue, then you have come across the Award of Garden Merit. Now, I have to admit, despite working as a garden editor for many years, I didn't know that much about how the Award of Garden Merit 
is awarded. I knew that there were some plant trials carried out by the RHS, but I didn't know much more than that, how the trials actually worked and so on. That was until earlier this year when I got asked to be involved in the Tillandsia plant trials for the RHS. So yes, plant trials do include indoor plants as well as outdoor plants. Traditionally, the RHS has focused more on outdoor plants, but they are putting that right now and starting lots more trials for AGMs for genera that we consider to be house plants, including, of course, the Tillandsias, the air plants. So I headed off to Walton Hall, which is a garden in Warrington in the northwest of England, a few months ago to meet up with the other members of the Tillandsia plant trial and find out what it's all about. Now, I am not a Tillandsia expert, so you may be wondering why on earth am I on this panel? Well, the group of people that come together to judge the AGMs for Tillandsias does consist of quite a few real Tillandsia experts, but... The RHS believes by having some people like me who are really knowledgeable about houseplants generally, but not specifically about Tillandsias, there's a degree of balance. So, you know, maybe if I was on a Hoyer plant trial, I would be just saying, oh, give them all AGMs. But of course, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. So by having people who are not particular specialists in a type of plant, hopefully there is some balance and the right plants get awarded AGMs. There are dozens of Tillandsia species, cultivars and hybrids involved in the trial. Where are these plants coming from though? Well, they are all being grown in a glass house at Walton Hall and the plants have been sourced from Every Picture Tells a Story, which is a well-known Tillandsia and bromeliad nursery here in the UK known for its incredible displays at the Chelsea Flower Show and other flower shows around the UK. So for each of the plants chosen, there are three specimens being grown, all in the same conditions. And these conditions are designed to emulate the kind of regular growing conditions that we might be experiencing at home, not giving the plant some kind of planty nirvana, their absolute ideal conditions, because that way we wouldn't really be testing how well they would grow in our own homes, which is the point of the AGM. So the plants are being grown in three different ways but all grouped together so if you can imagine and I do advise you to go and look at the show notes where you can actually see a picture of this each trio of plants of the same type is mounted on a piece of cork and each one is mounted in a different way so one just attached to the cork one is planted in a little pocket and the third is attached to a piece of wire, echoing the kind of ways that we'd grow these plants at home and allowing us to see if one particular type of growing suits a particular plant more. So over the next few meetings, every few months, we'll be turning up at Walton Hall as the plant trials panel and checking out the plants and their progress and then voting on which ones we think are doing well enough to be on their way to getting an AGM. But to do that, they have to fill certain requirements. What are those requirements and how does a plant actually get awarded an AGM? Well, I had a chance to chat to David Ford on this very subject. David is the vice chair of the Tender and Ornamental Plant Committee of the RHS and chair of the Surrey Group of Plant Heritage and holder of the national collection of Chinomalies, which are the Japanese quinces, an outdoor hardy plant. I highly recommend growing if you have a garden. You get some nice spring blossom and some rather delightfully perfumed little fruits, which you can turn into jelly. Anyway, back to plant trials. Let's find out a bit more about how they work with David Ford. Can't you break down what the RHS plant trials are and what it means for a plant to have an AGM. Of course I can, Jane. (laughs) It it, it really is fascinating because it's a side of work that the the RHS does as part of their charitable endeavour, which I think often gets really missed by the public and what these awards really mean and the amount of work that's gone in, in, that's entailed in the trials that um, get the uh, awards made. So the, the trials themselves... 
Um, they're, they're brought up by the various plant committees and then through the trials office based at Wisley and now in the other gardens as well, we'll gather together all the experts from around the country in a particular genus of plant, um, plus a few sort of plant journalists like yourself or other people that are interested. <laughs> and then together we'll assess the plants. I mean, for, for some of the plants, say for bedding plants, obviously this is over, over a year. Um, but for, for the uh, perennials and for house plants, it can be two, three, four, or even five years for some of the woody plants. And so what we've got is we've got all those people assessing those plants over a period of time to really come out with the best of that genus that we can recommend for the public to grow. So when someone goes to a, a, a garden centre and they see that little trophy symbol and an AGM, RHS AGM, it's the Award of Garden Merit. And although quite confusingly, we'll use that for house plants as well. But what it really means is that having looked at all the plants that would be available for the public, these are the ones that the experts would really recommend that you try and grow at home. And that is a really useful um, guide for those people starting out to actually think, well, actually, this is a plant that's, well, the chances are this isn't going to let me down if I follow the basic instructions, which we all kind of need when we're starting out. And even if we're experienced um, in gardening, it's still comforting to have that little AGM symbol, as you say. Um, so we're here for the Talanzia trial at Walden Hall today. Can you just run through how this particular trial is working in terms of what what's involved and what we're looking for when we're looking at these Tillandsia species and hybrids that we're testing out for the AGM? Oh, absolutely. So we're sort of guided by five main criteria when we're looking at plants. So the, the very first criteria is it has to be a good plant for appropriate use. So what we're saying is that this isn't, when we're looking at Tillandsia particularly, most people would be growing those inside as a house plant so those plants that may do well outside they're sort of that doesn't make them particularly relevant for the age for an AGM it's plants in normal uses so for a house plant someone that grew it in the house it's going to grow really well so that that's the first criteria that that's sort of grown normal grown as normal people would that it, it's a good plant we're looking secondly that it has a good form so it represents the genus well so that, it, that it, in terms of in terms of when we're looking at talansias we're looking at talansias you know we we want a nice sort of fine leaf form and a nice bulbous plant and a, maybe some unusual ones ones that bloom well so they've got to have a really good form as well the other criteria we look look for is primarily re resistance or relative to the genus so resistance to pests and diseases in terms of talansia i'm not expecting that to be a criteria that's a particularly important but obviously in other plant groups it are, is if you were looking at things like monada you'd be looking at sort of resistance to, to botrytis infection so the powdery mildew so that's the, the the third one the fourth criteria we're really looking for is that they're stable in in terms of its form um, so again with the talansia i wouldn't expect many of those to be unstable but of course there are many plants when we trial them that prove to be unstable so you, you start with a variegated plant and you end up with a plain leaf plant you plant, start with a plant which has really interesting flowers and sometimes you know over a period of years that interest and that uniqueness goes so things that are relatively stable the other criteria we're looking for the fifth one is that they have to be available so what we're trying to put together with an AGM is a real guide to someone. So if you wanted to grow a Talansia, for example, that not only have we trialled them and these are the plants that are going to give you the best bang for your buck, that on top of that, you can actually get hold of them. So with availability, we do have to remove AGMs from plants if they no longer can become available. And I think the other thing that the public need to know is that if a plant has lost an AGM, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's no longer a good plant. It often means it's no longer available because these awards we're looking for the average gardener. So what we're trying to do, all the expertise in the country from the RHS and from all the growers and suppliers and enthusiasts, we're trying to condense that down into some, to a bite-sized chunk that's really useful for a gardener. So if, if you're looking for a Talansia, by the end of this trial, we're going to be able to identify four or five, hopefully that will all look quite unique and quite different. But we reckon that these are the ones, if you didn't know which one you wanted, go for one of those because they're going to be the ones that perform the best at home.
Yeah, and it's fascinating to actually be seeing these plants growing in situ and looking at how some of them at this stage, we're sort of, where the jury's out. We're not quite sure yet whether they're going to be uh, getting an AGM, but there are some standout stars already, I think, that we're sort of starting to think, yeah, actually, this might be, depending on what happens in the next uh, few months and years, be an AGM. Uh, this is how long are we running with this trial? Is it three years? We're running three years with okay. this trial. So ideally, what what I would love is that we have a plant that looks good as a juvenile. So it looks good when someone first buys it, and three years later, it looks even better. That would be the ideal. But we can't rule out those plants that when you get them, maybe they don't look as quite as outstanding. But by the second or the third year, when they've produced their blooms and you've smelt that perfume, that we go actually. This is still a really good plant. It may not look quite at its best when you first get it, but in terms of keeping it on your window still at home, it's going to give you all that reward that makes it a really worthwhile plant to grow. And theoretically, you could have a plant trial where you just decide none of these plants deserve an AGM. You could, there's, there's no number, there's no uh, amount that you're looking for. Not at all. I mean, we, we try we try to keep the process as fluid as possible. So we never set out with a given set of criteria we're looking for. We allow the people on the forum, all those experts to come together and try and distill the knowledge. So even the characteristics we're looking for, when we plan the trial, so certainly when we planned this trial, we sat down and we decided an approximate set of criteria we thought we would be going to judge on. But certainly that's a very fluid idea. And when we've got everyone together and everyone's talking about the plants and bringing in their own bit of expertise, their own knowledge of, of growing the plant over years, those can sort of change. So those criteria can sort of change. But ideally, when we bring everyone together, the, the, what comes out of the AGM is something that we can all agree on are a good plant. For some trials, there may be quite a few. Um, for others, the, 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 there'll be there'll be you know (laughs) very few i've not been on a trial yet where we haven't awarded one agm i think when we're looking at what plants we're going to trial we're looking generally at plants where the genus has become a little confused so either we've had a lot of plants that were given agms at some point in the past and are no longer available and a whole load of plants with no agms that actually they're the ones that are around we need to look at or the sort of when we're looking at we've never grown them before, so they've never been in a trial before. But ideally, when we're putting plant to plants to trial, because the RHS has to put a lot of resources behind that in terms of getting the plants together, getting the trial, the forum together, getting someone to actually you know be a trials officer. And so it's, a, it's quite a commitment in terms of time and money, all those sorts of resources. So. We need, as a, as a committee, we're relatively certain that there will be plants that are AGM worthy <laughs> before <course>. we start. <laughs> and are there any other house plant genera that you're thinking, gosh, we really need to do some plant trials? There before? are. We have a slight problem with, it, with, with, with actually trialling pure house plants at the moment with the RHS in terms of glass house space and where we can do it. So if we can't actually trial the plants, then what we can do is we can have a round table discussion. So we award AGMs in the same sort of way, but we don't actually look at the plants. We rely completely on people's knowledge. So we will assemble a forum of people, uh, again, you know, like the Talanzia Forum, the gro- we'll have you know people that are growers, enthusiastic amateurs, national plant heritage, national plant collection holder if they're available as well. Put them all together in a room for a day and then go through the plants one by one and use their previous knowledge. So sometimes we have to do things like that. So certainly um, I'm, not at lo- I, I'm not able to tell you <laughs> what we've got coming up exactly, but certainly we're looking at things like peperomias and the hawthias and the lows, and there's a whole range of plants that we would like to get through. If I had my wish list, there's 40 or 50, that the Absolutely. RHS have to make me narrow it down. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's, re- it's going to be a really fascinating process to follow along, and um, hopefully listeners can follow along with me, and at the end we'll find out which Talanzias are AGM worth which is exciting it is indeed it's a, it's a very <laughs> worthwhile exercise and it's, it's certainly the thing that makes me most excited is is the privilege of seeing all these plants growing together Thanks so much to David for sharing that information and I will be keeping you updated with the progress on the Tillandsia trials and 
I'm also going to be interviewing Don Billington of Every Picture Tells a Story, who are supplying the Tillandsias for the trial in an upcoming episode to talk all about Tillandsia care. So we are going to be Tillandsia central for the next few months. But that's great because they're such good plants and it'll be fascinating to hear which ones come out on top in these plant trials. You may remember from episode 262 back in the spring of 2023, I was talking about Monstra Deliciosa and the fact that as a result of my research for my book, Legends of the Leaf, I found out that Monstra Deliciosa's variegated form was awarded an AGM from the RHS back in 1972, more than 50 years ago, which I found really interesting. I said I was going to try to find out a little bit more about this from the RHS, which I've duly done. And the information that came back from the RHS Lindley Library was as follows. You're correct that the plant received an award of merit on the 28th of March 1972, and a Certificate of Cultural Commendation in September 1972. These are awards which the main herbaceous committee awarded to plants or to the grower which are presented at the meetings or at shows. The RHS have not carried out a formal trial of monster of plants for the award of garden merit. Therefore, there are no reports. So there, I was asking if there were plant trials reports to do with this particular plant because when the plant trials are carried out by the RHS and indeed for the Tillandsia trial that I'm involved in, all of the records will be kept by the RHS ad infinitum for anyone who wants to take a look at them in the future. But because this plant was awarded an AGM via a round table assessment, which was a method that David Ford mentioned in his interview, there aren't any particular records about it. So that's a bit of a shame. And perhaps when I'm next at the House Plant Committee of the RHS, of which I'm a member, I'll make a representation that it's about time that Monsterers had their own plant trials because gosh there's so many more on the market these days and it will be really interesting to do an assessment of which ones really work in a regular house environment. But anyway I wanted to fill you in on that I'll include those notes in the show notes if you want to take a look and remember full transcripts are now available immediately for new episodes so do go and check those out at the show notes at janeperone.com. Time for a little housekeeping update. I've got my dustpan and brush and my white vinegar at the ready. If you are on Patreon, you will find that there's a new way of listening to my exclusive Patreon podcast, which is called An Extra Leaf, and that is on Spotify. You can also now listen to the ad-free versions of the show on Spotify. If you are a Patreon subscriber, you basically have to link up your Patreon and your Spotify accounts to do it. And if you need any help with that as a Patreon subscriber, please let me know. I'll be happy to help. I will be sending a message around with instructions on how to do that. If you're using Spotify already to listen to podcasts, it's a great way of listening to an extra leaf. And if you don't know what all this Patreon malarkey is about, well, let me explain briefly. It's my monthly crowdfunding platform. So if you really like the show and you want more, 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 and you also want to make sure that On The Ledge keeps coming, then it's a great way of supporting the show with a small monthly payment. You can be a legend like new Patreon subscribers Jenny and Vivian. They've unlocked that extra content, plus the legendary December mail out. I need to start thinking about that because it comes around very quickly where I send a special card to everyone at the legend and super fan level. Thank you also to Crawford and Hannah, who've upgraded from crazy plant person to legend. What's the difference between those two tiers? Well, crazy plant person, you just give a dollar or a pound a month and you don't get much back other than, and this is a big thing, a warm fuzzy feeling for supporting the show. Now if this all sounds good but you're thinking, mm, I, I kind of want to try it out first, well that's okay. You can join people like Devi who just started a seven day trial of Patreon. 
And if at the end of seven days you think, yeah, it was okay, but I don't want to stick with this or pay for it, then that's absolutely fine. You can cancel. I do love a try before you buy. So if you want any information on all of these aspects of Patreon, head on over to the show notes at janeperone.com to find out more. It's time to talk VPD. And that means it's question of the week time. This one comes from J.A. Clark, who wants to know the optimum VPD for Nepenthes alata and indeed Nepenthes. That means the tropical pitcher plants has a genus. So I guess the first question to ask is what the heck is VPD? Don't feel bad if you've never heard of it, though, because it is a term that's much more widely used in professional horticulture and amongst people who use grow tents, particularly the cannabis community. So unless you're in one of those categories, you may well never have come across this term, and that's absolutely fine. So the VPD initials stand for Vapor Pressure Deficit. But what is it? Well, We need to first look at the difference between another term that relates to water and air, and that's relative humidity. So that's one you will have heard of. Relative humidity tells you how much water there is in the air at the temperature the air is at, because warm air can hold a lot more moisture than cold air. So relative humidity is a ratio telling you how much water vapour is in the air compared with the maximum amount that could be held in the air at that specific temperature. So that's relative humidity. VPD, on the other hand, well, that's telling us basically how hard it is for the plant to transpire. And it does that by telling us the difference between the pressure inside of the leaf and the pressure outside in the air. And it's usually measured in terms of pounds per square inch or millibars. It's an indication of pressure and it's um, a difference measurement rather than a ratio measurement. And VPD is not related to temperature. Here's another way of putting it if you're still trying to get your head around this. So VPD is a difference measurement. It's telling you the difference between how much water vapour is currently in the air and how much water vapour the air could hold if it was completely saturated that got to the point where just no more water could be held. Obviously, the inside of a leaf, that's basically completely saturated, more or less, compared to the air, which usually isn't completely saturated. So that produces a gradient, which then allows the plants to transpire. That means releasing water into the air from the leaf. So when VPD is high, It means that transpiration is happening too rapidly. The plant is losing water through the stomata, the breathing holes, very, very quickly. And the plant could be in danger of drying out. On the other hand, when VPD is very low, that means transpiration is being hindered and the plant may not be transpiring quickly enough to allow water to pass through it and those nutrients to be sucked up via the medium of the water and provided for the plant's uh, needs. The ideal VPD range is going to be different for different plants that you might have in your home. So a fern might have a very different VPD from a cactus, for example. If you want a deeper explanation, I found an excellent video, uh, which is from a company called Argus, which I think makes uh, equipment for measuring VPD and humidity. And I will put a link to that in the show notes because it's a really excellent video that explains both VPD and humidity and the differences between them. So if my explanation hasn't cut the mustard and yeah, it is a bit complicated, then go and check out that video and you will understand the difference really well. I'll link to an article I found in Inside Grower magazine, which explains the difference between VPD and relative humidity. If you want to go into more depth about this, that's a useful place to start. So now we understand VPD. How does it relate to J.A.'s question concerning Nepenthes? Now, I wasn't too sure about Nepenthes and their needs. So I asked Tom Bennett, who's been on the show before. Tom is the carnivorous plant grower behind... Tom's Carnivores, that's tomscarnivores.com. Loads of fantastic information there about Nepenthes. And what Tom points out is that Nepenthes love very high humidity. 
at night time. So that usually results in a low VPD. In other words, there's not that much difference between the, the pressure in the leaf and the pressure in the air. They're quite similar. And when the, when the VPD is low, that means the plant's breathing holes are going to be open, but they're not going to be able to transpire very much because there isn't that much difference between the conditions in the leaf and outside the leaf in the air. And that's usually what draws the water out when transpiration happens. Now, Tom notes, Nepenthes are quite different from many of the plants people grow in tents. They like very high humidity, i.e. a low VPD at bedtime. Close to 100% humidity is common, so the charts you'll find online showing ideal VPD aren't really relevant for Nepenthes. For that reason, I've never paid much attention to VPD. I measure temperature and relative humidity and have found this more than sufficient. So what you need to know really for growing Nepenthes is the fact that, as I say, they need really humid air at night time. I would suspect if you're getting Nepenthes care right, you don't need to overly worry about VPD. If they've got nice humid air, they're going to be pretty happy, particularly Nepenthes alata, which is one of the most popular and widespread tropical pitcher plants that are grown. It's been picked because it can cope with a wider range of conditions. It's not a great specialist that's going to require extremely uh, intense care. So that's the best answer I can give you, J.A. Clark. Uh, I'm sorry that it's not like a question of saying a number, but it, again, without knowing your setup or what you're trying to achieve, it's hard to give a very specific answer. But I hope the explanation of VPD and how it works helps somebody. And yeah, do go and watch that video. It's really, really useful. Whew, technical one this week. I hope that's <laughs> I hope that's helped somebody. And maybe you can impress your friends with your newfound knowledge of VPD. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, do drop me a line. The best address is on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. Send me lots of information, pictures, where you are, what you're trying to achieve, and I will do my best to help. That is all for this week's show. I do hope that you have a happy and successful time with your plants in the next couple of weeks before the next episode, and that birds of prey and your plants manage to stay well away from each other. I think it's best. But I will give you extra bonus points if you have a houseplant called Peregrine. I'll see you soon. Bye! The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops. The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku. And Whistle by Benjamin Banger. The ad music is Nothing Like Captain Crunch by Broke for Free. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. Music